So, welcome to the last panel on our conference agenda, and uh, we are very grateful for your being here today. And this is this is the panel that gets gets very much to the bottom of things. We are talking about genocide prevention in action, and we are talking about how our government and our uh, our regional organisations are organizing themselves to actually implement through their policy the agenda of genocide prevention. Uh, you are probably aware that, uh, that in the past few years we have had the chance to move from rhetoric to actual policy development on this issue. This is an immense change. Our governments for centuries have been declaring that mass killing is bad, but haven't really done anything else than wars to deal with the reality of them. Now there is a change, and you are looking at some of the individuals that are deeply involved in their government's activities related to genocide prevention, making genocide and mass atrocity prevention actually a daily work that, that lays foundations around the world for societies that structurally avoid the realities of massacres. So I would like to ask the panel participants to talk about their work in this panel. And I have sent them four questions in preparation for this panel. And these, I told them from the very beginning, these are not questions they need to answer, all of them. They can focus on whichever question is more, more interesting and more relevant to them. So the first one is, how does my government, regional organization, organize to prevent mass atrocities? Very basic. The second one goes a bit longer and asks, what was the process leading to setting up these structures? The third one is, what are the challenges of carrying out this job day to day in my position? And the fourth one is, are there any lessons based on my experience that need to be shared with other bureaucracies considering similar structures? The great the great news in our reality is that more and more governments around the world are considering setting up ways of institutionalizing mass atrocity and genocide prevention within their governments. The, the scary news is that we don't have too much knowledge about how this works and what the consequences of setting up these institutions are. Here are some people who have worked now for a while in making these structures reality, and they will share their experience. I would like to invite first Onyine Onwuka to, to talk to us about her experience coming from a regional organization. Onyine, first of all, is one of the alumni of the Auschwitz Institute, and we are very pleased to have her join us today. And she has been an analyst programmer, a program officer in the Early Warning Directorate in the ECOWAS Commission since 2009. She worked as a senior research officer and head of, head of collective defense unit in the defense and security department at the Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution in Abuja from 2000 to 2009. Yeah, you have the floor. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, TB. And then, um, yeah, sometimes they say you save the best, but you save the last for the best. But I, do, I hope we meet your expectation. But the beauty is um, the energy level has gone down, so I'm sure we're not going to have a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> but on a more serious note, um, I must confess that I've learned so much from the audience, from the experts that they brought on board. And a lot of what we're supposed to say has been said, so we just put icing on the cake and perhaps share a little of our perspectives uh, to enrich uh, the discussion. Uh, like he said, I work with uh, the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS, and um, his regional organization, like you well know, uh, in the African continent. Um, yes, TB sent us for questions, and he was so kind. He said, you could choose anyone you wanted to answer. Uh, you know, most lecturers will say, attempt all, but um, he was he's a kind one. He said, choose what pleases you. Uh, so that's what I'm just going to do. 
uh, with the first one that he asked me to speak on. Yeah, from a West African perspective, I speak and more, more generally from an African perspective. Listening to many of the speakers this morning, I realized that there were a few people who had actually been in an environment of conflict, of genocide, who, you know, formed uh, the panelists. And it's easier to talk about theoretical issues and then coming from a place where you see it daily occur. Our West African region is, is perhaps one of the poorest regions in Africa and in the world, and also has a lot of conflict, intractable conflict, and I keep hearing Mali, Guinea-Bissau, Guinea, Cote d'Ivoire coming up. So that tells us that we live in a place where the reality of conflict, genocide, you know, probably emanate from. And that explains why Africa has made a tremendous progress in terms of institutionalizing mechanisms for uh, fighting conflicts and, and genocide and mass atrocities. From the uh, African Union perspective, since 2000 with the Constitutive Act, you know, they, they made real declaration about the issues of genocide. And of course, uh, trying to deal with the issues of sovereignty and the supranationality of uh, regional organizations. Um, with ECOWAS, our ECOWAS has been at the fore of most of these regional initiatives way before 2001, way before 2005 uh, World Summit outcome, of R2P, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, the conflicts that broke out just at the end of the Cold War, the Liberian, Sierra Leone crisis, and all that. So, uh, in effect, we have actually been involved in issues of responsibility to protect, and we have a lot of um, legal framework to back that up. Even though we started with ad hoc arrangements, uh, I mean, with the Liberian crisis and Sierra Leone, we didn't have uh, the instruments that you know institutionalized um, intervention, particularly given the third pillar of R2P. I'll bet we put in our effort and we try to deal with the crisis. So by 1999, um, ECOWAS developed its uh, regional framework for conflict prevention. Yeah, uh, so that was a landmark learning from the lessons of ad hoc deployment that we did uh, the previous years. So the 1999 mechanism protocol uh, that we have is actually the major legal text that uh, you know talks about dealing less responsibilities to uh, early warning, where I work, the department I work. You also have uh, ECOWAS standby force. It used to be called, it used to be called ECOMOG. You also have Department of Political Affairs, Humanitarian, and you have all those agencies. But more interesting, you also have um, the Council of the Whites, you know, looking for pacific ways of uh, you know, dealing with uh, conflict. So what I'm going to tell you briefly is that for us, genocide is one of the human security concerns. For us, conflict and its impact is comprehensive. And that's what I, I just want to emphasize, that a lot of what goes on in genocide, yes, is distinct because of its nature, but it takes place most of the time within the theater of internal conflict. And like uh, um, Francis said in the morning, identity-related conflict and related to the issues of struggle for resources, competition for space, and then people begin to manipulate issues of identity. It's just, uh, people don't just become, uh, you know, they just don't target others. There has to be something that is under contest. And from where we come from, there's a lot of pressure on resources that is scarce, and also a lot of greed of a few, you know, who, who, who just want to use identity to deprive. Um, TV, uh, in a nutshell, this is what we do. But as the uh, panel goes on, I'll talk more about early warning and high point signs of genocide prevention. Thank you, Nina. We will, we will move on and, and move, of course, we will talk a lot more about the ECOWA system and, and you have the freedom to, to ask Nina a lot more about what, how does this translate into her daily work in the question section, but now we are going to move to, to the national models of organizing to, uh, for preventing mass atrocity and genocide. 
And I would like to invite first Victoria Holt to speak about the United States situation. Uh, Victoria has joined the Bureau of International Organization Affairs as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in August 2009. Uh, she is responsible for the international, international security portfolio, overseeing offices that address UN political affairs and the Security Council, peace operations, sanctions and counterterrorism, and regional organizations and related policy issues. Uh, I also have to mention that before uh, working in the State Department, Tory worked uh, for the Stimson Center, and for a while we were very concerned uh, about losing to, to government the, the energetic voice that she has always been in terms of mass trust and genocide prevention policy and issues. But we are very happy for the work she's doing, and we'd like to hear her share that with us now. Well, thank you, TV, and thank you to Sherry and everybody who organized this excellent conference. Um, I'm very pleased that my colleague Beth and I both are able to be here today. So uh, we'll divide the duties a bit. Uh, I will speak a little bit more about how we got to having our government focus on atrocity prevention and our first efforts at it. And Beth, I think, will pick up and, and talk about some of the details. But And, and TV, I didn't get your four questions, so I'm just going to talk about a few things. Um, <laughs> and I want to start with why it matters because I think this is still something that is in this room taken for granted. But any time you ask and see a government start to engage in a new project, it's going to compete for space with other projects. And it doesn't matter how good a cause it is, somebody else is not going to get the same meeting at the same time with that senior official. So why does it matter? And I think it goes back, and maybe it's a particular American experience that I've observed, and this is at this point of some of a personal observation, but whether you start with World War II or you look at coming out of the Cold War in the 90s, you have a, a generation of policymakers who deeply are personal about when conflict escalates, people are attacked, and political violence turns towards mass atrocities and genocide. And their feeling of feeling like they didn't either see it, or when they saw it, they didn't know what to do, or when they took action, it didn't succeed, or they didn't take action soon enough, or whatever it might be, there's a sense of we could have done better, we could have done more. And I think that has come together. Unfortunately, it came out of the 90s. I think you know, the headlines on Rwanda and Trebinitz are the best known cases. But there were other conflicts during that, that decade that really stayed with a lot of people. Um, so you can easily say, OK, you, you can look back and see these, these sort of challenges. But it has helped coalesce in part because something that is an unusual out of government uh, enterprise that I with, uh, must acknowledge I was part of, but the Genocide Prevention Task Force gave voice to uh, looking at whether or not the U.S. government was well organized to try and prevent mass atrocities and genocide. And this was an enterprise begun by the Holocaust Museum, the American Academy of Diplomacy, and the U.S. Institute of Peace well before we knew who would be the next president of the United States. And it was aimed at whoever would be that president and whatever administration would come in as an inquiry into how good is the U.S. government at early warning, at prevention, at response, and accountability measures. And you know, it interviewed hundreds of people. It was chaired by former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright and former Secretary of Defense Bill Cohen. And had senior government people from past administrations of all parties and experience. And what this did is it validated that this was in itself a unique problem that had both moral and strategic weight, and that it was an enterprise worth looking at as a government activity. And it was risky. These people put their names on the line and put it on a report. And you know reports in Washington can come and go pretty quickly. But I think it was at a moment when the incoming administration said, hey, you know, this resonates. And I will say, I also joined the administration. We had crises in the first couple of years, which immediately put in front of us how good are we at seeing it and responding. Um, and I, you know, my day job is worrying about what's on the Security Council agenda. And it's kind of constant. If you're on the Council agenda, you probably have uh, some major challenges to peace and security, and many of those conflicts deserve the question, could this escalate, has this escalated in the past, how do you prevent that from returning? So the Genocide Prevention Task Force laid out a couple of big key points. One is there's nobody in the U.S. government whose day job is genocide and, and atrocity prevention. Found lots of fabulous individuals, but they weren't knit together in an organizational framework. Nor was there a larger overarching policy framework to deal with this kind of conflict prevention. And I know there's an ongoing discussion about whether atrocity prevention and conflict prevention are actually separate. 
but to the extent that it is a subset of conflict prevention, couldn't really find, the finding was there wasn't anybody whose responsibility it was to drive a process to make sure this was on the table and it was being addressed. So the Obama administration came in and even before the atrocity prevention board and the effort to do atrocity prevention work was announced, you could see early signs. If you looked at the national security strategy, it's a document that a US new administration usually puts out within its first year. It had within it a whole paragraph on the prevention of genocide mass atrocities. And it's just a paragraph. And when I waved it around at some of the foreign service officers who worked for me, I forget which crisis was driving us crazy. I said, we have to do something. They quite candidly said, well, we'll see, we'll believe it when we see it. And I, I bring this up because it's in the challenges category. It's not that foreign service officers want atrocities, but it was another new idea. And how much legs and how much uh, uh, progress would this idea make? And I think that is an ongoing question. It's in, your, it's in our challenges list. But then about a year later, we also saw following the national security strategy, the Pentagon's quadrennial defense review. It has language in it about prevention of genocide and mass atrocities. So does the State Department's QDDR, the Quadrennial Defense, sorry, Development uh, and Diplomacy Review. I, I turn the Ds around, we have to check on, online what it's actually called. Um, and then soon after the announcement that we would have a presidential study directive. Now by this time, this sounds like a lot of bureaucratic blah, blah, blah. But what it means is that a study directive, this was number 10, that means there aren't a lot of them. Unbeknownst to us who are about to get the directive, we were, being deter we were being asked to spend 100 days doing research writing and writing report back to the White House and they were in a hard deadline. And this, this announcement was that the President had decided um, that it is a core national security interest and a core moral responsibility of the United States to prevent mass atrocities and genocide. That's a pretty major headline. So it basically tasked the rest, there were 13 departments of and agencies of our U.S. government were asked to participate in this started with weekly meetings. And well, I guess what I'm getting to with this is, this is hard work. This is bureaucratic hard work. This is like, you know, put down the immediate thing in the, your, your Blackberry and you're, you're being tasked to write papers on everything from early warning for accountability measures, for long-term uh, conflict prevention, lessons learned, doctrinal guides. And most of this is not something the State Department was used to writing up let alone Homeland Security, Department of Defense, the Agency for International Development, Treasury Department, Justice Department, intelligence communities, et cetera. Nonetheless, fast forward 100 days and we finished this report. And we basically self-recommended things that we could do to bring attention to atrocity prevention. So perhaps I will just give some observations on what we are trying to do, why we're trying to do it, and then and some challenges going forward. I think in the State Department context, we have very much the framework of uh, how do we work with the community of analysts and intelligence to see things earlier? What are the common signs and what are the flashpoints that we need to look out for in any of the countries around the world that might face conflict? And I must say that um, in our case, the intelligence community has done a good job at working with outside open sources as well as um, their own analysis of what are the indicators that might lead us to narrow that case down. Because if you go to a regional bureau and you say, we have to look at every single country you observe, it's impossible. You can't look at every country in the world. But these indicators have helped us narrow down a subset of countries that are at greatest risk. We had a little internal question about what are we talking about? What are mass atrocities? What are genocide? Does this compete with responsibly protect? What about protection civilians? And I think we've tried to keep moving past that and say, and, and my colleague, the lawyer, can define this better. Um, it's about preventing purposeful violence against individuals, usually for political aim. Mass atrocity sort of captures the way we've thought about this. It does not mean to compete with either responsibly protect, which we support, nor protection of civilians, which we also support. So internally, we had to sell the idea to some colleagues. And I will just tell you personally, I uh, went and talked to some of the regional bureaus, which are often the powerhouse of diplomacy. And to my surprise, in meeting with senior foreign service officers, most of them about halfway through the conversation, which was me telling them this initiative was underway, and we we're kind of curious about their views. They said, you know, when I was in blip, this happened, and they started telling me a story. And I think that is one of the most powerful things we've experienced, is that our diplomats around the world know this is a potential reality for them. And they are hungry and eager not to have speeches, but to have tools. Tell me what I need to look for, and then tell me what we do about it. Who are our partners in the world, and what has worked in the past? Which leads to a second challenge, which is at least sometimes it's hard to, governments aren't necessarily learning institutions. 
They're about leadership and management. They're, they go out and experience the world. And so how you stop and say, well, let me check the last 20 years of experience for this. It, you don't, we don't have that kind of library. So it's often real time anecdotes and how to take that and teach it. So one thing we've done is we finally have a course at our Foreign Service Institute now that brought in people who have experienced this in the past and are starting to teach other Foreign Service officers what to look for. It is still, though, a work in progress. Another uh, thing I might mention is about the indicators issue. And there's no perfect analysis or predictive tool, I think, yet that we are passing to our colleagues. Um, but asking the question, who is threatening who with what and why? It's just a simple question. But if you bring it into your policy meeting on a crisis or a human rights situation or an interagency meeting and you embed it in the existing processes, that in itself can be a radical change. So instead of nobody saying, is this situation one that could escalate out of control? What are the minority groups at risk? Da, da, da. If you just routinize it, if you put it into your meetings, if you put it in the interagency discussions, you get a much better shot at someone saying, actually, yes, or actually not really. We don't think that's a concern. So some of this is a very much a bureaucratic process and trying to make that. Uh, looking for flashpoints. I think we all realize that elections now are something to look at. But what else is on that list? What else is a quick change of government? a land dispute, a fight over a migration route. How do we know better that narrow list of things to look out for uh, that may catch people by surprise? And then how do we invest back in our tools? My day job is focusing a lot more on the UN. So in the case, for example, of UN peacekeeping missions, how do you help those missions know in the areas they deploy what those flashpoints are, what they do to respond, what the military does if they're asked to provide security to protect civilians, which is a much longer conversation. These are not necessarily things that those missions have always been trained for. So in our case, again, trying to make this institutionalized, we're trying to put some money into training for peacekeepers. The headline is not atrocity prevention. It's peacekeeping training. But what does it talk about? It talks about how you look out ahead, you understand the indicators, and what you do if on your watch violence escalates. Which maybe gets to one of my last points, which is if we succeed in the U.S. government, what's happening is we have, a week, we have monthly meetings of the Atrocity Prevention Board with very high-level officials under secretary, assistant secretary level. Uh, this is not their day job, but they've all committed to it. Others of us meet nearly weekly. But the more we do our work, the less it'll be the headline of atrocity prevention. And it'll more be just the business of our government. Back to what the president said. It's a moral responsibility. It's of strategic interest. So we're going to hopefully fix our tools. And also to say, we are just beginning. We are modest. We're not proud of this in the sense we've achieved it. We've just begun the conversation with ourselves. And so I think we have, cannot yet claim that we have figured this out and you're yet here to teach other countries. We can merely talk about what our, amb our ambitions are and hopefully learn from others as we all move forward together on this. So thank you. Thank you, Tori. Now we will go to Beth Anskak, who's going to, to continue talking about the US emerging US model and and uh, Beth uh, is the deputy is a deputy to the ambassador at large for war crimes issues in the office of global criminal justice of the US Department of State prior to her state department appointment she was professor of law at Santa Clara University School of Law where she taught and wrote in the areas of human rights transitional justice international criminal law public international law, international humanitarian law, and civil procedure. We are very happy to have her here and talk talk about the, uh, the bigger picture of the APB and its oh, Thanks work. very much. It's great to be here. Thanks to the organizers. Um, and thanks for inviting my friend to come with me. So we had a nice <laughs> little chat yesterday up on the train. We never have time to actually talk to each other. We're literally like <laughs> passing in meetings and you know shouting things across the, across the room. So it was nice to have sustained time to chat about some of the work that we've been trying to do in terms of really operationalizing this um, Presidential Study Directive number 10, the report that was generated as a result of that study directive, and now the work of the board, which exists as a standing board, as Tori mentions, that meets um, monthly in order to consider issues of atrocities prevention. And so I thought I'd talk a little bit about how this whole process has begun to be operationalized at a very, um, at the sort of level of, of that I'm working at um, on, a, on a weekly basis, and also think about some of the do-outs that we're engaged in, the lines of effort that we're trying to implement, 
that all flow back to this um, Presidential Study Directive 10 report. It was an incredible piece of work. Sadly, it still remains classified, but there is a fact sheet that the White House put out, and so if you're interested, you can track that down. That does a pretty good job of laying out the general contours of what the, these various lines of efforts are. But there really are dozens and dozens of them. And so slowly but surely, we've been trying to set up processes whereby we can focus on these various imperatives and start to put them in motion, or to the extent that they already existed, improve them, retool them, shape them, connect them with other processes in such a way that now the government is actually working together in a coordinated fashion to carry out the imperative that Tori mentioned. Um, so one of the most interesting things about the Atrocities Prevention Board process is how interdisciplinary and how interdepartmental it is. It really is an interagency process. And we're a huge government. We're a behemoth government. And so getting the right people in the room together, talking together, and talking about this topic is in and of itself an amazing accomplishment. So often this issue becomes siloed in sort of sub-offices or sub-departments of other offices. And now I know people to talk to in every single major agency that is addressed to this issue. If I have a sanctions question, I know who in Treasury is dealing with that. If I have a military question, I know who in the Department of Defense or the Joint Chiefs that I should call in order to get information I need. So that alone, it's not sexy, it's bureaucratic. But when you have a government that is so enormous and so separated, that in and of itself is a real accomplishment. Um, a big chunk of our work really comes down to um, the intelligence community and the amazing work they have been doing in their collection efforts to focus on, as Tori was saying, these risk factors that are internal to a particular society and these trigger events that may happen episodically like an election or even a natu natural disaster that would happen. And so the intelligence community is trying to collect that information. They will be producing soon an estimate of of mass atrocity around the world that will help to guide our future priorities going forward. They're also helping to think about things like enablers. You know, how do other entities within a society, business interests, for example, um, enable atrocities to happen so that we can look for areas where we can exert leverage in order to prevent um, atrocities from escalating or, or violence from escalating into a situation of atrocities. We're hoping that this more, this improved and this more focused um, collection and analysis will help us, the policymakers, and our posts and embassies that are located in these at-risk countries respond more quickly, respond earlier, so that we can undertake what may be ultimately lower cost and less invasive mes measures, rather than waiting until something is a full-scale crisis situation and then being in a situation where we're trying to mobilize sort of boots on the ground, as we heard earlier today. The Department of Treasury is um, working hard to think about how to better use their sanctions authority in order to address mass atrocity situations, in order to cut off funds, for example, to individuals or to groups and organizations that are fomenting violence um, in particular countries. They're helping to work with posts, embassies, non-governmental organizations, and others to basically outsource the collection of information, the kind of bio-identifiers that are necessary to engage in a good, airtight sanctions regime. This is hard to do. We often get calls from civil society that says, why haven't you sanctioned uh, the intra -hamway? Well, we need to know names, we need to know national identity numbers, we need to know bank accounts in order to be able to create a rigorous and robust sanctions regime. And so the Department of Treasury has been working to improve their ability to do that work. They already have a series of country-specific and uh, topical, general um, sanctions regime dealing with counterterrorism, for example, proliferation of weapons, et cetera. And so we're exploring ways that these existing <coughs> sanctions regimes can be utilized in a mass atrocity or a, a prevention of atrocities context, and also thinking about what new authorities we may want to propose to the president to implement as part of his authority um, to do so. We're also trying to think about how to better coordinate with the EU and with the Security Council on the sanctions regimes that those entities generate so that we have sort of a seamless web that's synced up. We don't have gaps, we don't have loopholes, that we're coordinated in our ability to sanction individuals and organizations. 
Um, at the State Department, we have a huge um, effort to engage in multilateral, bilateral, and regional outreach to see what our other partners who care about atrocity prevention are doing and to try and bring more countries and organizations into the fold so that we can think about ways to be working together. And in that regard, I want to congratulate the Auschwitz Institute for this memorandum of understanding with the AU um, and also your work in Latin America where Argentina is very much in the lead on this in terms of gathering a network that's continent-wide around this imperative of preventing atrocities. We've also explored um, ways to increase the ability to surge specialists into crisis situations or at-risk situations. Um, this is something that USAID has done in the national, natural um, disaster context, thinking about how to do something similar, a team that's multidisciplinary, a team that has the relevant regional and language abilities, a team that has good skills that can work together, analyzing hate speech, for example, dealing with violence against women or violence against children, um, getting those right teams together and finding ways in order to surge them into situations in which an embassy may feel overwhelmed or may not have a particular expertise. And in this regard, we've been working with the Justice Rapid Response in Geneva, which is a multilateral intergovernmental um, version of this, essentially. They conduct regular trainings and have created a roster of individuals that they're able to surge into these um, crisis situations. We're trying to do something similar, creating a roster that's government-wide, that has all the, in the database sort of all the right boxes that are relevant to an atrocities prevention um, goal. We're also trying to improve the ability to do information gathering and collection, not necessarily through the intelligence community, but through our posts and our embassies abroad. And in this regard, we're looking at things like alert channels and tip lines, ways to make sure information gets to the right people. Um, we, as I said, we're a huge government, and so information flow is often a real challenge to, to still trying to manage to make sure that everyone that needs to understand the most current information has that information so that we can make a concerted policy response and act quickly. Um, sometimes it takes time for information to move, and so we're trying to improve and streamline that process. And finally, we have the issue of justice and accountability. My office has always been the home for these issues. It's the Office of Global Justice. And a number of the recommendations in the PSD 10 report relate to this area. And the theory is, as we discussed earlier today, Juan Mendez brought it up, that to the extent you can have robust responses and accountability, that will prevent a culture of impunity from setting in. We still don't know it's speculative to the degree to which you know, criminal accountability leads directly to deterrence, but I think we can all accept at an intuitive level that a culture of impunity does enable violations to happen. And so to the extent that we can make responses more robust, justice-based responses more robust, that can contribute to at least eliminating that culture of impunity. What's interesting about my job is this off, my office existed well before the Atrocities Prevention Board. We were doing this work. We were working with tribunals to make sure they had the personnel and the information and the resources they needed, working with national systems to improve their capacity to bring um, cases to um, address the needs of victims, psychosocial assistance, et cetera. Um, we were doing all this work. Now that the Atrocities Prevention Board exists, that has really elevated our work and placed it within an interagency context where now our work is part of a national policy. And so in that regard, it's really highlighted the work um, that our little tiny office in the State Department of you know nine or, or 10 people was doing and it has made it part of this larger um, conversation. And so that's one of the changes that I really see in, in terms of elevating the imperative of justice and accountability as a tool for atrocities prevention. So I'll stop there and I'm happy to talk more when we have more time. Thank you, Beth. And now we shall turn to, to discuss about the Argentinian government's efforts and uh, I would like to invite Ramiro Riera to, uh, to share with us uh, his experience in this work. Ramiro is, a, uh, is representing here the Department of Human Rights of the Ministry of Defense uh, of Argentina. Uh, he's also a human rights professor at the University of Buenos Aires and at the National University of Lomas de Zamora. Ramiro? Thank you, TV. Well, uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank uh, to the um, Auschwitz Institute and the uh, Cardoso Law School for the invitation to participate in this great conference and to be part of this prestigious panel, of course. And um, 
uh, of course, to thank you all of you to be here so so late, so so tired. <laughs> so um, what I'm uh, gonna try to do is to um, show you some uh, aspects of the Argentinian policies in uh, prevention uh, of genocide. Um, that is, uh, speak about uh, a little bit about the um, setup of uh, the national mechanism uh, for the prevention of genocide. So I, will, I would like to, to start by saying that as from the beginning of 2012, with the launch of the Latin American Network for uh, Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention, uh, the Republic of Argentina uh, started to set in motion several measures tending to comply with some aspects related to the prevention of genocide. In this regard, the government adopted concrete measures to, that are worth highlighting and which are essential to the actions that have been carried out in different fields to support the prevention of genocide. In this context, and based on a proposal presented by the National Human Rights and International Humanitarian Law, the direction of the Ministry of Defense to create an institutional body responsible for the implementation of policies to prevent genocide, different national bodies with human rights competencies from the national government started dialogue, dialogue to exchange opinions and experience so as to make a common effort and develop a national mechanism for the prevention of genocide. This initiative aims to coordinate policies related to the prevention of genocide so as to achieve more efficient and more effective results in this regard at the governmental level. I wanted to give you now some aspect uh, of the legal framework of Argentina because it's uh, a little bit important too. The first thing is that since uh, 1956, the government of Argentina is a party to the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, as everybody knows, adopted uh, by the United General Assembly in 1948. In this regard, it's important to mention that after the amendment to the Constitution in 1994, the Argentinian Constitution, of course, said a convention is recognized therein according to the stipulation of the Article 75, Section 22 on the Constitution. On the Constitution. Therefore, the above mentioned convention is included as uh, part of the legal, uh, Argentinian legal sorry, system and the government of Argentina has the responsibility to enforce the rules and international obligations contained therein. It's a common knowledge that the prevention of genocide is a one of the international obligations stipulated in the Convention, for example, in the Articles 1 and 8. In this regard, it's important to mention that, that in the Rep Republic of Argentina, punishment of the crime of genocide has been regulated with the ratification of the International Criminal Court Statute. But there is a, still a pending matter related to the development or of a specific and effective measures for the prevention of genocide. On this topic, and in compliance with the, uh, compliance, sorry, with the international obligation accepted by the government of Argentina, it is proposed to create a national mechanism for the prevention of genocide. This mechanism shall be established by an executive order from the president with the main purpose to coordinate actions of the pertinent gu governmental nations and provincial body entitled to work in the prevention of genocide. Now, I, I wanted to, to give you um, a few information uh, of the background of this initiative. Uh, for us, there was two important facts to start with this initiative. On one hand, uh, the um, the, the four-point action plan from the former Secretary General of the United Nations, presented in, in 2004. And uh, in the second, in the, in the other hand, in March, I, I want to repeat that, but in March 2012, there was an event uh, organized by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Justice and Human Rights of Argentina, the Secretary for Human Rights of the Presidency of Brazil, 
as well the Ashridge Institute for Peace and Reconciliation, with the support of the United Nations Office of Special Advisors on Prevention of Genocide and Responsibility to Protect, to launch the Latin American Network for Genocide and Mass, Mass Atrocity Prevention. Sorry, I need to, some water. This initiative is directed to the prevention of future atrocity and is based on the Latin America experience on the matter through the development of a community of civil servants with expertise on the subject. Moreover, it is committed to include through training and regional cooperation the concept of education for the prevention of genocide and mass atrocity as a priority in the Latin America regional agenda. So to conclude, some actions at the uh, local level to show you what is this mechanism for the prevention of genocide. The uh, Republic of Argentina is working in the development of a national mechanism for the prevention of genocide with, with the before mentioned goal to make the interinstitutional coordination of actions among different national and provincial governmental bodies with responsibility in the field of prevention of genocide. The national mechanism shall have the following missions, two missions. In one hand, to establish a communication and information sharing network, including the different competent bodies so as gather and process information, and if necessary, submit this data to the pertinent bodies at the United Nations levels. And in the other hand, the second mission, it has the aim to develop a training curriculum in the area of the prevention of genocide. In addition, the national mechanism shall have the following competencies. Three competencies. It's going to be the, from the national mechanism. First, to assess about potential threats and give early warning. For example, mechanisms for communication and information sharing about cases and related situations. And cooperation with NGOs interested on the matters with scholars or the fields of human rights and international humanitarian law. Second, of the, of the competencies of the me national mechanisms is to prevent systematically and build awareness. In this case, we can find organized congress, seminars, and training activities on the field of human rights and international humanitarian law with subjects like, um, like as responsibility to protect, international criminal law, collective security, no discrimination, etc develop a training curriculum including minimum contents required about the elimination of discrimination and the prevention of genocide, both for the private and public education system and also for ongoing training of public servants of the office and bodies involved. The last one in this, uh, in this uh, competence is develop standard and assessment criteria about mass communication and advertising. The last competence is to foster cooperation and information sharing. For example, to establish procedures to collect and process information and to share information with the competent United Nations and regional organization body. For example, Organization of American States, the Union of South American Nations, the Southern Common Market, as uh, the Special Advisor to the Secretary General for the Prevention of Genocide, the Commission of Human Rights, the Special Reporters, the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, etc. The national mechanisms shall include uh, a coordination committee entitled to request information to the different office of the national government, government when demand necessary it necessary. Make research on the matter, consult with experts, organizations, governmental bodies, and any other person or organization that could cooperate on the matter. And finally, give advice on the matter at the local, at the, excuse me, at the level of national or provincial bodies or bodies of the Ciudad Autónoma de Buenos Aires. The coordination committee shall have the following members. First, representative of the Ministry of Defense, Foreign, uh, Foreign Affairs Ministry, Security Ministry, uh, Education Ministry, Justice and Human Rights Ministry, uh, in this case, th through the Secretary for Justice, the Secretary for Human Rights, 
and the National Institute Against Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Racism. And finally, the Council of Ministry, through the Secretary for Public Information and the Secretariat for Institutional Reform and Consolidation of Democracy. This coordination committee shall be chaired by uh, all the members in turn for one year. In this regard, the body chairing the committee shall consolidate, consider, consolidate excuse me, and submit to the authorities of each member the annual working plan and the annual report. Besides, the chairing body shall call for a meeting of the committee and develop the agenda of the mechanism. In addition, there are plans to create, as part of the mechanism, a council for the prevention of genocide, which shall act as an, an, uh, an advi advising, excuse me, and coordinating body to work in close cooperation with civil or national governmental agencies that could be important to achieve the goals of the national mechanism. The members of the Council of, for the Prevention of Genocide will be representative of agency that the coordination committee considers considers relevant for the satisfactory achievement of the goal of the national mechanism. In this uh, council for the prevention of genocide, we, we can find the input for the civil, um, uh, excuse me, for the NGOs and the uh, academic institutions. Lastly, the mechanism considers to establishment a federal network for the prevention of genocide to sh that shall organize the participation of a national or provincial body or bodies of the Ciudad Autónoma de Buenos Aires in the federal framework to coordinate national and provincial governmental policies related to human rights. The, the previous meeting for the creation of the national mechanism with the participation of all the parties involved were held in the month of July 2012 and February 2013. It should be noted that in November 2012, the Republic of Argentina, the Auschwitz Institute, and the Office of, of the Special Advisor organized a training program for all the members of the National Mechanism. During the above mentioned training program, the members discussed on the organization and the creation of the National Mechanism and received various recommendations from the Auschwitz Institute and the Special Advisor which significantly contributed to the implementation of this public policy. Finally, to conclude, it's necessary to mention that the national mechanism shall start functioning, functioning during 2012, promoting the pertinent executive order in this regard. I think I finish. Thank you, Ramiro. And thank, thank you all for your contributions, and I, I'm very grateful for your keeping within the time. Uh, this means that actually we have time for questions and I would first like to open it up for the panel itself if you have any questions observations related to to your presentations it's not necessary only if there you, you want to have the first say oh, yeah yes yeah uh, thank you TB I just uh, I, I earlier promised you that I would give you a brief on early warning system that we do. It's been coming up and that's my job. Yeah. So just to share with you a little, I won't uh, exceed my minutes. Uh, within the ECOWAS early warning system, we work with 66 indicators, human security indicators. So we're not only focusing on genocide or, or mass atrocity, everything that threatens human security, agriculture, land, uh, uh, human rights violation and all that. And we have 45 field monitors. Our system is, is based on both quantitative and qualitative analysis. I've seen a lot of GIS uh, visuals being shown here. And we use that within our system to balance uh, whatever analysis we make. And I tell you, in practical terms, uh, it's a very useful tool because it validates uh, the, what, the analysis that you're bringing up. And it's been useful to us in ways of convincing member states because we're following patterns, we're following trends. And how do we do this? We have 45 field monitors. Our system is a unique one that works with the civil society and I've heard that come up several in this conversation. The important role of engaging with civil society to partner with you is this vision of uh, what the genocide, mass atrocity, human security threats. So 45 of them 
uh, 15 are from civil society, while 30 are government. It's important for us to get the government to buy into this regional initiative. Otherwise, they will think uh, you're spying on them. And just to let you know that, we, we say we use open source like every other you know, early warning system. But what can I tell you from being a practitioner is inadequate. Mm -hmm. Because the information is already there, and we discover that you could be doing early warning with an information that's already out there. And we are looking to see how we can expand our network and probably engage with some of the closed sources because it's important for timely response and also to have adequate in information that, you know, that is genuine. Uh, these are some constraints we face. But working with civil society for me has been most encouraging because they are there at the grassroots. And that takes me to uh, our engagement with R2P. In June last year, uh, with the Global Center, uh, we organized the first regional initiative on responsibility to protect in Abuja. And we had a lot of stakeholders, I see some faces here who were at the meeting. And it was the first time in Africa that we, we decided to open up the uh, you know, space to talk about R2P in its entirety. And we talked about it in the context of regional uh, organization. What do we have in ECOWAS that speaks to R2P? How can we adapt what we have? And we also, it was a, a, an intellectual criticism of R2P and the different areas you've talked about. Why are the emphasis only on, third, on the third pillar? Is it about regime change? We brought that up because coming from an African country, we have this nuance that R2P and all that is about regime change. Mm -hmm. But we work for regional organizations and we see the reality for us to engage with government, for them to understand this. That takes me to the other part I just wanted to let you know. That after the uh, engagement we had last year with the Global Center, my uh, department, the early warning, now is uh, trying to follow up with the focal point initiative that uh, the Global Center is pushing. And uh, we are hoping that by this year we can start advocating with member states to, you know, buy into the R2P concept and also to see if it's possible to get them to have a focal points. Ghana already has a, a national focal point. It's a West African country. So there are all those initiatives uh, that are going on at that level, regional level. And it's very essential for us to, you know, deconstruct what R2P means and also to have it interpreted in our own context. That way, nobody's going to see it as a Western concept because we're talking about lives. And then finally, from my experience of early warning, I just understand that it's everybody's business. Genocide, mass atrocities, it's everybody's business. It's not about government. Uh, you can have the best of analysis, as was said earlier. You can write the most beautiful reports, and then Mali just goes boosh on your face. And they ask you, early warning, what did you do about it or what didn't you do? What's my final word? Political will. It's so, so important. And talking about political will, it's not just within uh, member states in your region, it's international political will, of course, because you discover that the international community reacts when the interests of the big powers are in those countries where the conflict is taking place. So we must have a way of getting the international community to also look at latent conflict, perhaps in countries where there are no resources that could muzzle their interest. So political will for me is so key to translating the spirit of every early warning report you write on genocide, on mass atrocity, and how do we do that? We keep talking about it like we're doing, and that's what Auschwitz is doing trading some of us, having us come to uh, the center there in Poland, and also partnering with uh, the AU. And I also hope that it could filter down to regional organizations where you can have uh, that kind of engagement with government officials, for them to understand what R2P concept. It's not about regime change after all, but they also have to domesticate it and within their own context. I just thought I should share a bit of perspective uh, on what we do on a daily basis. Thank you very much, Anina. So now uh, the floor is yours. Uh, we are ready to take questions. Yes, and Sam is there, the gentleman 
in the back was the first one uh, to the left. <laughs> I'm seeing already four here. <laughs> Thank you. My first question to the um, uh, my sister well, of uh, the African Union. Equus. Oh, Equus. Sorry, Equus. <laughs> <laughs> I think ECWAS also is a part of the African Union anyway. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, talking about the African Union, the African Union, ECWAS has been engaging al-Bashir for a long time on this, what you call it, uh, constructive engagement. Nonetheless, they failed to stop the atrocities right now in Sudan. This constructive engagement has been going on for a long time. It has just become like appeasement to al-Bashir to continue his crimes. Um, I'm wondering, uh, are you evaluating this? Are you actually reflecting on this or not? The other thing also, the African Union has a very modern and more advanced actually document, even more advanced than the United Nations Charter itself, which is called Africa, African Union Constitutive Act. According to Article 4, that actually obliged the African Union to intervene in a situation like gross violation of human rights or something. Nonetheless, this African Union actually absent, you know, all this kind of uh, atrocities, including Darfur and the others. To the, um, uh, our friends from United States, I think we appreciate that United States actually, um, you know, um, uh, advance its work on the issue of, uh, you know, preventing genocide and mass atrocities and all this kind of thing, and even Obama doctrine in terms of mass atrocities, all this kind of thing. I just want to refer you to the um, uh, former Secretary of the State, Colin Powell, who qualified Darfur and defined the Darfur association as genocide. And according to the Genocide Convention of 1948, if you qualify a certain situation as genocide, you have to intervene to stop it or to prevent it. Yet, there is nothing actually going on, and the genocide is unfolding in Darfur, and now it moved actually to South Kordofan and Blue Nile. I just want actually a reflection on that one, and why, you know, till now, the situation is there, regardless of the you, are, you define in a situation as genocide or something like that, and this is actually legal binding and genocide convention right now is international customary law rather than, you know, just soft law or something like that. Thank you. Uh, yes, let's take two other questions, one from each side. Ted will be the next one and the lady there, the next one. This is probably also somewhat a question disguised as an intervention. But um, <laughs> I, I recall reading when the, the sort of the, the first thoughts of the, uh, the Atrocity Prevention Board was set up that the person who was thinking about this saw this as kind of questions of wiring and plumbing. And I think one of the things that we learned from the State Department folks is how complex this is within the US government to actually merely handle the information flow questions and merely to get people coordinated and merely to figure out who's doing what, where, and when. Um, fortunately, unfortunately, other countries are not, don't quite have this set of problems. But there are sort of both two kinds of questions, one of which we've discussed um, in great detail and the other which we've discussed a bit less. The first is the information sharing and figuring out who's responsible. And then the second question, and this gets into the focal point issue that the Nigerian, uh, the, the echo loss person was, was raising, and that is, um, how do we actually politically coordinate? And is it, what, is, what are the challenges of getting um, the information flow and the coordination right? Because the information flow involves one set of folks and the coordination of political will involves another set. Um, and that's, a, I think, a challenging duality. And my sort of suggestion or, or thinking about this was sort of keyed by um, what Ed Luck said earlier today and that is that maybe the issues that we should, that these sorts of organizations and these sorts of projects be focusing on are not the top level ones. I mean, it's not the Libyas of this world because those are the issues that sort of, um, you know, get taken up by people who are primarily concerned with the politics. And, you know, an example of that in East Africa would be the ICGLR intervention in uh, or efforts to intervene in DRC. And what you saw immediately there was this was not an issue which was sort of dealt with with people at the sort of functional government level, but it was dealt with by political folks. So the presidents of, of, of these countries went in and tried to deal with that. Um, so if that's, you know, if that's where there's the greatest possibility of being successful and of contributing, 
then I think this really pushes us into how we think about early warning. And it, I think it pushes us into thinking about, well, what are the areas that we can sort of intervene in early enough so that we would have information to prevent it from requiring the political people to come in? And the obvious example of a success in that case you know, is Cote d'Ivoire. Um, because again, you could sort of see that there was an, something emerging. Um, it was possible through a combination of, I guess, pressure and diplomacy to make, uh, you know, to have an effective intervention. So my question is, how can we, should, first of all, should we? And secondly, if my analysis is correct, how can we focus your efforts on these kinds of cases, the ones in which, um, you know, having focal points would be effective? and having sort of an effective regime in which you can both coordinate information sharing and political coordination would work. Yeah, and the third one, Alex, there in the second row. And I invite you to, to have short questions. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Alex Bosky from UN Association of the UK. Um, just a very quick question. We've spoken a lot about the, the bureaucratic kind of coordination how exactly do you ensure that elected representatives are behind this kind of coordination in the bureaucratic level? How do you keep them educated um, about the agencies that are being set up um, in a way that they understand how to use these institutions to ensure that there is an effective action? Thanks. Thank you. Now, I would like to give the word to the panel. Who would like to start? Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Um the gentleman, yeah, ECOWAS and AU. I mean we're members of a AU. But I I will, I will speak as an ECOWAS official and then give you a, a little of what I know about AU uh doing with Abushir. It's a bit complex and you know, like I mentioned, uh we, we, we need to deconstruct the meaning of all these international concepts. And you, you, you have the same, the same color of skin like I do. I can see that. And you know that a lot of us believe it's Western imposed. And a lot of African, I'll give you a practical example. Um, in 2010, uh, when President Tanja of Niger uh, wanted to, you know, turn the constitution for him to remain in power. I was in charge of Niger, and we kept writing reports, going with the UN, uh, you know, our office, UN Office of West Africa, say, Gini, we were there talking about Niger and all that. And apparently, he was the chair when they signed in the, the protocol that put a clause that you could not change a constitution six months to election. He was the chair of the commission, and he signed, ratified it. And when it got to his turn, he couldn't leave. He wanted to stay and manipulate the constitution, and eventually, you know what happened. Uh, we we managed to, you know, get him out or through a coup or whatever it was. But that tells you the the, the notion. Now, nobody wants to be the first to say Alba should go because what if what if it's me? What happens to me? It's a bit difficult, and this this is a bit complex. You know, I, I don't know. A lot of people are receiving Abushir and talking about uh, ICC. And of course, there's a growing uh, debate to have an African Court of Justice to do trials. Why is everybody in, in Africa going to The Hague? Why is Babu going to The Hague? Everybody's going to The Hague. So it's a debate that's ongoing, but impunity must stop. And that's why the debate needs to continue uh, and, and get people to understand it. So I, I don't have all the answers to it. Like I told you, it's all about at the realm of politics. Uh, morality is, swallows up uh, political, uh, uh, political consideration, swallows up morality. It's the other way around. And then the focal point initiative is, is perhaps what I'm more interested in uh, because it's positive, it's moving, it's evolving. Yeah. So we, we had the, the meeting and then, of course, it's talking about how we could get uh, national leaders appoint, you know, very senior officers who would mainstream the issues of genocide prevention into uh, their national laws. Uh, this is uh, still a bit sketchy, and uh, at the regional organization where I come from, they're trying to work out. But it's an idea. Building on what we have in the early warning system, I told you we have focal points, and we were thinking, is, is it to elevate 
the focal points to that level. But we needed to, you know, distill some of these issues to see, do you need to have, you know, particular senior, a particular criteria that really looks at the issues of genocide, the issues of mass atrocity. So it's still at the discussion level, but I just flagged it because it was a direct outcome of the, of the meeting we, we had with the Global Center for Responsibility to Protect. And uh, I can tell you that before the year runs out, we'll probably tidy up that uh, the, the office of uh, uh, the UN Office of Prevention of Genocide are also interested in all sorts of initiatives. So uh, the idea is that there is engagement with the issue of R2P, unlike before, the issues of genocide. It was all subsumed under human security, but with the growing impunity and uh, mass atrocity that's going on within uh, our region, we think it's important to also deal with it as, uh, you know, as a separate issue uh, why also considering it as a human security uh, challenge. So um, him, uh, the issue of focal point initiative for us is important to have people, if we had that kind of a person uh, in, in Mali, we'd probably be getting information about what's going on there, the Tuaregs that are being attacked, it will feed in directly into the system. And like um, the, the earlier you know, panel talked about, it's useful and uh, you can always act on an information because you can verify it and they're not giving you, you know, some one-sided information. So it's a, a growing initiative and we hope that it can crystallize into something much more uh, concrete, uh, uh, by the way. Maybe I'll take, um, uh, I'll take a response to the gentleman in the back too about Sudan. Uh, when we started this initiative, uh, one of my colleagues quipped, we don't get a magic wand. What it means is we will announce this sort of audacious ambition, but there's no magic that comes with it. It's just hard work. And I would say on Sudan, actually, it's something that multiple administrations of the U.S. have worked hard on. You're absolutely right about Colin Powell. And you'll see today, I mean, we have a presidential envoy. There's support to three peacekeeping missions. A third of the U.N. peacekeeping budget goes to three missions in South Sudan, Darfur, and um, Abia. And so there's no easy answer for that. But I think sustained diplomatic attention is partly um, what our ambition is, and that we we look at every possible way to solve a problem. So, I mean, that's not a long answer on Sudan, but just to say, I don't think that is a case that suffers from lack of attention. Um, but this gets to what um, uh, the gentleman up front was talking about, political coordination and what cases you look at. And I think this gets to the political will question. I think absolutely we find that the goal is not just to revisit the headlines that are already capturing the attention of the international community and our senior leaders. As a matter of fact, it's what you were suggesting. Is let's look at every other case that might fall into this bandwidth, the ones we don't want to miss. Because the point of having attention to this issue is that you see the ones before they escalate and you take some action earlier. Because if you wait too long, the decisions only get harder. And this is core to political will. The more we can learn about what works, what we see, what works early, how you divert that path from an escalation of violence against civilians to just a normal political debate and conflict, that is more um, able to be grappled with. And so we, I will tell you there's at least one country we looked at and we realized, oh, they have all the indicators and yet we give no support whatsoever to measures of peace and security in this country. It was like all medical aid, which is also a good cause, but wasn't gonna deal with the fundamental underlying issues. So because of that examination, we have now had sustained, very quiet, you'll never read about in the paper, diplomatic engagement, high-level visits, looking at the international community's efforts on it, and that's the way it should be, I think. That a lot of this won't make headlines, but that we do that kind of day job, which gets to political will, and I think, just an example for us, I think um, we did a, a couple of scenarios. I was in a few myself, and then we started running them more often for uh, people within our government. Foreign service, but not only. And it has an, uh, these fake newscasts of these, this fictional country, and there's like a little newscast, and there's something on, the Security Council's not meeting, and da da da. And you, you stop the film, and the two or three different groups of people have to figure out what they would do next. And we've run this a number of times, and it escalates, and it always ends up in genocide. So no matter what they do, it's terrible. Um, <laughs> but people are cautious. Even in these fictional environments where there's no cost for recommending to your boss some big project, they're like, uh, 
could we do a speech or should we ask for a meeting? Or, and so what we've realized is sometimes it's just teaching people to be a little forward leaning and to know the own tools of our own government. It's like, what do you do? And that can be as simple as the day that I got an email. Um, a woman forwarded to me, she also worked in the State Department from a friend and it was from a Gmail address and it was a picture of a place where uh, basically um, uh, there had been violence. And this email lands in my inbox. And what do I do with it? Who do I send it to? Was this an email of a picture of localized violence last week or three years ago? Who validates it? Who takes actions based on that? And I wrote back and said, thanks very much. I'll forward this on. And I did. And she came back and said, I was really scared. And I didn't know if my boss would approve me sending it to you. So can you kind of protect me? That's not what we want. We don't want people to feel like their job is to hide things. We're trying to teach them. So again, it's not always the headlines. It's that day job of having everybody engage, as you just said, and being part of the answer. Thanks. Anybody else who would like to add? I'll just maybe address the congressional question and the lawmaker question. And I think that's something that, frankly, we have not done a good job of. Um, part of it is it's so new. We've been so busy getting our sort of house in order in terms of the interagency and the executive branch that we haven't engaged Congress enough. And as a result, this whole atrocities prevention project is basically an unfunded mandate. I mean, we are, you know, you mentioned that nobody has this in their job description. I think there's now one human being. Oh, we have more than that now. Definitely do. I hope that's true. Yeah. I, I can think of one human being that in his job in his job title is prevention of mass atrocities. There's plenty of people who do it a lot, but they do, do many of them still do have day jobs or other pieces of their work. It's not a full-time staff. There isn't a staff that staffs the, the atrocity prevention board. It's a lot of us who are pulled in from different directions. And so, and it's hard for us to raise money for ourselves, right? There's a whole appropriations project process. It's months and months and months and years in advance. And so I think there is a sense of doing better outreach, not only to congressmen and, and women, but also civil society, NGOs, and to build a national constituency around atrocities prevention so that people care about this. They ask about it at political meetings with their representatives. They call their congresspeople when they see on the news that something awful has happened, that it, it is part of our national consciousness. And I think that's something that conferences like this are terrific for, and we all should be doing more of that at our local level and whatever church groups, you know, educational groups that we have, giving talks about this work, um, spreading the word, getting people interested in this work, student groups, you know, the, the Saved Our Four movement was incredible, Invisible Children, you know, the fact that my 13-year-old knows who Joseph Coney is, is a miracle, um, you know, and it, it's, it's that kind of real grassroots work that is the way that we'll create a national consciousness around this. Well, thank you very much for your answers. We are actually running out of time, but I would like to just just outline the fact that while in the times of the movement calling for governments to organize for mass atrocity and genocide prevention, we were very much entertaining the magic wand scenario <laughs> of governments uh, once they organize being able to stop everything that moves around the world. Uh, unfortunately, we are finding out that it's not that easy. What we see at the Auschwitz Institute as very important is to create a space for governments to be reflective about this process. Even though new, it is necessary to think about it. And there are lots of lessons to be learned from the very beginning. And there's lo there are lots of chances to assist processes that are developing in other governmental structures that are uh, trying to reinvent the wheel. So uh, thank you very much to all our panelists. And thank you very much to you, our audience. And uh, I would give now the word to Sherry for three minutes. I'm going to take one minute. Um, I just want to say thank you all very, very much, um, especially all of you who have been with us from the beginning of today. It's been a really long and interesting and productive day. I want to thank the panel as well. Um, for a really interesting engagement. I was going to sum up, and I'm not going to because it's late. I'm going to spare you that. For those of you who have signed up for CLE credits, please make sure to sign out when you leave or you don't get them per the Bar Association rules. 
Um, there's also things to pick up um, as you leave. And finally, I guess I'm just going to end where we started at the beginning of the day with uh, General Romeo Dallaire's comment that the historical tide of engagement on these issues is continuing apace. And I think we've seen that all day today. It's continuing on the international level, on the regional level, on the national level, and on the individual level, and that we would all be on the wrong side of history if we were not to engage in this pressing issue. So thank you very much for joining us today.